Hey guys, I'm here to do a review of Sorts on Winter by Ali Smith, which came out in the UK in November and is coming out in the US in January. And I'm overwhelmed discussing this book. It's almost like a collection of feathers. These little moments of being brushed or tickled by a phrase or feeling or reference and you only realize how much weight they have when you stack them all together. So it's difficult to track where all of my impressions came from and how they coalesced into the love that I have for this book. But let's see. Let's see where we end up. This is the second interseasonal quartet. I did a review of the first autumn that I'll link below, but we have a whole new set of characters in this book. One is Sophia, who is a retired businesswoman who now lives alone in a big house in Cornwall. Then there's her grown son, Arthur, or Art, who runs a blog called Art in Nature. That's exactly how it sounds. And he and his girlfriend, Charlotte, have just broken up but he promised his mother he was gonna bring Charlotte home for the first time this Christmas. So he pays a random girl named Lux to pretend to be Charlotte. And during their visit, Sophia's estranged sister Iris shows up at the Cornwall house too. So it's a self-consciously traditional Christmas narrative of four very distant people being brought together under one roof. This can be read as a standalone novel. There's only one explicit connection between the books that's related to a main character in Autumn, but you'll get more out of this one if you've read the first because they share so many characteristics. There's a small thread near the end of this one about a forgotten female artist, just like there was in Autumn, although this departure is shorter and less jarring. Both books also have scenes from ordinary life. So there are some in Autumn in a post office and there's a similar section in winter in a bank. And it's fun to have these scenes of mundanity in these philosophical books. When you say this is a series about Brexit and the power of stories and different media, you don't expect to follow the protagonist to the bank. Um, and Smith doesn't attempt to make these scenes like abstract. She captures the boredom and frustration of these places where we end up spending so much of our lives. It's like she's saying, hey, if I'm going to capture modern life, like, how could I leave these things out? Smith makes another quietly subversive statement in the scene where Art meets Lux. Lux is reading at a bus stop, and Art is drawn to her because of how engrossed she is in her reading material. And when he finally approaches her, he sees that she's reading a takeout menu. <laughs> so this is making fun of stereotypical meetings where a person's reading something really eclectic or profound, and the observer instantly infers how profound this person must be. But as it turns out, it's not just a setup for a joke, because Lux is really enjoying the experience of going through this menu and imagining these dishes. And she tells Art that she doesn't want to taste them, because then uh, imagination would clash with reality. So what she's doing, in a sense, is fiction reading in, in the purest way, creating an experience in your head that can be closed off and sheltered from the outside world. Like in Autumn, the wordplay is so fun. The last few pages have the first explicit mention of Trump, and there's an excerpt of a speech he gave in July about taking back the phrase Merry Christmas. So some of the book's last lines are, in the middle of summer, it's winter, white Christmas, God help us, everyone. So in the middle of summer, it's winter, can be referring to this summer speech that mentions Christmas, or it can refer to a cold feeling of dread stealing into all of us, no matter the actual weather conditions. White Christmas can be talking about the song and movie, or about Christmas for white nationalists. God help us, comma, everyone can be her asking God to help all of us, but there's a space between every and one. So it could also mean that she's asking every God, like every deity, to come down and help us. Like, that's how much intervention we need. I enjoy the wordplay for its own sake, but it's not just a flexing of linguistic muscle. Like in Autumn, there are certain words that are pulled apart and used in different contexts. In the beginning of the book, Sophia's being haunted by a floating head. So Smith plays with the words ahead and the word ahead, getting ahead or getting ahead. And what it amounts to is a fascinating tactic of treating English like a foreign speaker would, 
one letter or one space makes all the difference to a native speaker. One minuscule change conjures up entirely different connotations. And when you step back from your own language, you can consider how perilously close so many words and phrases are to each other. I lived in the Czech Republic for a little while, um, and I made some mistakes in my day. So, snažím se means I try. Smažím se means I fry myself like a piece of chicken, okay? That's one letter between communication and humiliation. So when you see your own language in this deconstructed way, it's suddenly not surprising how imperfect our communication is. And on the flip side, considering the tenuous connections amongst all these arbitrary letters and the synapses that fire when we hear them, it's kind of surprising how well communication generally works. But this treatment of English reinforces the perspective of Lux, who remains the book's biggest enigma, but who we learn is an immigrant from Croatia and has trouble understanding English idioms. And interestingly, when Sofia learns that Lux is an immigrant, her mental concept of her changes, she goes from thinking of her as Charlotte to thinking of her as that foreign girl, and the reader's primed to notice such a clear language shift. Both autumn and winter jump around from past to future to present, from a chapter to chapter and within chapters, and there are some really nice touches with verb tenses. Art and Lux have a great conversation on the train on the way to his mother's house, and when Lux falls asleep, Art starts thinking about how interesting she is and, and imagining the rest of the train ride using the future simple tense. She'll say this, he will raise an eyebrow, she will laugh. The scene ends there, so we don't see the, the real remainder of the train ride, but the future simple tense is ambiguous enough that it sounds like he's imagining the future, or planning the future, or maybe it's the real future. Maybe they do end up saying these things to each other. We can't know, but the wording leaves room for all those possibilities. Many parts of this book are a riff on A Christmas Carol, so I was inspired to finally read it, and the tones of the two books are so similar. The opening lines of A Christmas Carol are, Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Dickens uses the opening to establish that Scrooge's business partner Marley is definitely dead because Marley is going to appear as a ghost later in the story and the audience can't doubt that he's a ghost. But Dickens is, is partly tongue-in-cheek in the process because the proof he uses of death isn't an actual body, it's that enough people signed the registry. Smith combines Dickens with Nietzsche, and the opening lines of Winter are, God was dead, to begin with, and romance was dead, chivalry was dead, poetry, the novel, painting, they were all dead, and art was dead, theater and cinema were both dead, literature was dead, the book was dead. So these are the conditions that Winter's readers need to understand before entering the story. And just like Dickens, Smith is partly tongue-in-cheek. A Christmas Carol is about a man seeing the story of his life for the first time with shocking clarity, and Winter's characters are also forced to reckon with the stories of their lives. Sophia's sister Iris has always called her Philo, and Sophia assumed this was because when you put Philo with Sophia, it becomes Philosophia. But over Christmas lunch, Iris tells her, no, no, I meant like the thin Philo pastry the kind of pastry you can almost see through, it's so nearly not even there. Yikes. Um, at another point, Sophia and Iris are arguing over who's responsible for telling Art a story that he remembers from his childhood, and we never learn who's right or, or if both of them deserve credit for the story. This is a book of pervasive murkiness. My absolute favorite moment comes when Lux tells the drawn-out synopsis of a Shakespeare play with a, a princess and a jealous stepmother, a woodsman, fake poisons, hallucinations, and Art is embarrassed about this and thinks, 
Oh God, to make herself seem more like the imagined Charlotte, presumably, Lux is making up a terrible, bland fairy tale plot that's nothing like Shakespeare and pretending it's Shakespeare. And after pages of this story that we're led to believe is crazy, we learn it actually is a Shakespeare plot. It's the synopsis for Simoline. Um, and throughout the book, Art is on edge because his ex-girlfriend Charlotte has hacked his blog and Twitter accounts um, and keeps tweeting intentionally false information. And there's an excerpt in here from the Art in Nature blog. And it's so awful that I thought it must be Charlotte hacking into his account and, and doing a really funny parody of Art's style. But then it's revealed that it's a real blog post. Art wrote those words earnestly. The overarching point is that you often don't know what's real in winter. Real things seem fake. Fake things seem real. Things that are serious come across as jokes and vice versa. And it doesn't matter how careful of a reader you are, you will be tripped up at some point. And I think that's why people are, are talking about this as a book that addresses the issue of fake news. For me, it's subtler than Autumn in the way it confronts our current political landscape, which doesn't necessarily make it a better book, but it's what excites me more to read. You might be thinking, you just gave a ton of stuff away, like you talked about so many scenes, but honestly, I've barely covered anything. There are major aspects of the story and structure that I haven't even touched on, and there are a thousand little details for you to still explore. Overall, I love this book for making fun of so many things without being nasty and for being concerned about the state of the world without being cynical. It's not a good choice for you if you're in the mood to be told a story because this story refuses to, to lie down and be told. It dances and flits around. But it is a great book for you if you're in the mood to be an active participant in a story and, and to shape it with your own thoughts. And personally, I really valued the time I spent with this. Let me know what you think about Winter, if you read it or are planning on reading it, and I'll see you soon. Bye guys. Thanks for watching.